1.4 billion people, five time zones, zero footballers. When I made my video about India being bad at football about a month ago, I sat down and said, hold on a second, there's another very big country that ain't very good at it either. Fresh off the back of an Asian Cup campaign where they scored a grand total of zero goals all tournament and sitting 88th in the FIFA World Rankings, China are one of the biggest underachievers in the world of football. So from the Chinese Super League to corruption and match fixing, this is the weird story of why China can't kick ball. Now China have created many things in the history of the nation. The likes of silk 6,000 years ago, the compass, <clears throat> oh, sorry. The compass, even alcohol as early as 2000 BC. Cheers to that one. But there were even early developers of the beautiful game too. Suchu, which became very popular in around about 200 BC, is cited as one of the earliest versions by FIFA of a competitive ball game that uses your feet. And it translates to, quite literally, kick ball. Now, whilst I'm not going to lie, it's not greatly similar to the world of football right now. There was no VAR back in those times. Yeah, look, I'm sorry. Yes, Sash was a yard offside there, mate. What the? Fucky. But it did involve kicking a ball through a hoop without the use of your hands and without the ball touching the ground. The early days of headers and volleys, shall we say. And they have history in the early days of association football too. Reaching the round of 16 at the Olympics in both 1936 and 1948. But as of right now, they're not even a top 10 AFC nation football-wise in the FIFA World Rankings. Sitting 13th behind nations like Iraq, Uzbekistan, the United Arab Emirates, Jordan, Oman and Bahrain. They dropped nine places in the World Rankings after after a disastrous Asian Cup campaign. They did in fairness claim more points than India, being two in the group stages, but scored the same amount of goals. Zero goals, they scored zero. Nil-nil draws versus Tajikistan in 99th in the world rankings and Lebanon in 120th were followed by a one nil defeat versus already qualified and eventual winners, Qatar, and it saw them crash out to huge public dissatisfaction. And on top of that, there were other poor results outside of the Asian Cup too. A loss to Hong Kong, a pretty spiritual one, given the complexity of the relationship between Hong Kong and China right now, and even the renaming of the Hong Kong Football Association to include the word China in. A draw versus Malaysia, as well as losses to Uzbekistan, Oman, and New Zealand. Don't get it twisted though, they weren't getting battered. They were pulling off some okay results, like draws to Saudi Arabia and Australia, who are definitely seen as better footballing nations. But for a nation of 1.4 billion people, sitting at a world ranking of 108 at one point recently is absolutely outrageous. So let's take Take things back to the good old days to understand the rise and the eventual fall of the national team. We start off back in 1979 where China rejoined FIFA after a dispute with the organization because they recognize what is now known as Taiwan as the Republic of China. 21 years go by without being involved in the football association, they eventually joined back and results in fairness improved pretty immediately. They claimed third place in the Asian Cup overall in 1976 and reached the semi-finals again in 1988 before claiming third place again in 1992 and once again make it to the semi-finals in 2000. They were regularly throughout the 70s and 80s and also the 90s, making it into the final four of Asia's premium football competition. And they were coming close to qualifying for the World Cup as well, losing in a final playoff game versus New Zealand back in 1982. Then in 1986, needing just a draw against rivals Hong Kong, they managed to bottle proceedings, losing, leading to stadium riots from fans after not qualifying for the World Cup. Yeah, now who's sash is offside, you little dickhead. Then in 1990, they could have easily qualified, only to concede two late goals in the final three minutes versus Qatar and go out of the group stages of qualifying again. They were like the Tottenham of Asian qualifying. China. But through this time, the fortunes were improving for Chinese players individually. We're starting to make the move to Europe. Ji Jin joined FC Zwolle in the Netherlands. Gu Guang Min joined SV Darmstadt in Germany. And by 1988, the captain of the national team and his striker teammate had both joined Partizan Belgrade in Yugoslavia. Then Yang Chen would be the first Chinese player to play in a big five league when he joined promoted Eintracht Frankfurt in the Bundesliga. If you're watching the Premier League and you're as old as me, you might remember names like Sun Ji Hai, who helped Manchester City get promotion from the first division and obtain mid-table stability in the Premier League. Might need him back once those 115 charges hit. Li Tai and Ji Zheng joined him at Everton and Charlton respectively, Zhang Cheng Dong at Raya Vayakano and Hao Jun Min at Schalke. In contrast, every current player in the national team setup that's just recently been called up for international duty plays in China. Nobody plays outside of the nation. And this burst of actually having players playing in top five leagues 
across Europe, saw them even qualify for their first and so far last World Cup. This was the 2002 edition, one of the classic World Cups of our era. In qualifying, they won 12 of a possible 14 games, losing one and drawing the other. They were imperious, only to get to the tournament and go out without scoring a goal. But honestly, it was progress. The fact they qualified and qualified so easily was a real turning point. Or it should have been. Now, China were going global with their World Cup exploits. But ladies and gentlemen, you can go global yourselves from the comfort of your own home. And that's because today's video is sponsored by the lovely people over at NordVPN. And why choose NordVPN? Well, unlike me and my knee, you'll feel safe when moving around. Not only can you become safer online with one simple click, with Nord's threat protection that checks every single file that you download for potential malware, you also get all the great perks of a VPN. Being able to set the country that you want to be visible in for a wide variety of options. Now you can use that again to be safer online, but also to view some of your favorite content. Gone on holiday and know that you won't be able to watch the Premier League on Sky Sports this weekend. Never fear, you can set your location back to the UK just so you can watch your favorite games online. Watch all of the football, all of the time. But not only that, choose NordVPN because it's the fastest VPN on the planet. Giving you unbelievable speeds and a 30 day money back guarantee for everybody. Plus need to use it on more than one device, bruv, you can use it on 10 at the same time if you need to. So you can get your exclusive NordVPN VPN deal with four months extra by using the link down in the description below. It's a risk-free VPN that you need to try out. Once again, the link is down in the description and you'll get a 30-day money-back guarantee as well. By 2007 and things were starting to go downhill again. The Asian Cup of 2007 was massively disappointing and it drew real criticism from their fans. They lost to Uzbekistan 3-0 to go out of the tournament. And their FA, as well as politicians in the country, had set targets for China to be one of the best Asian footballing nations by 2030 and be genuinely competing for the World Cup in 2050. So the man to guide them to that glory, Jose Antonio Camacho. Yeah, he lost 8-0 to Brazil. Uh, pretty early doors. Uh, Fucking hell, man. Which wasn't really competing for the World Cup overall. But look, listen, hey, first of all, if there's one thing I do know about Brazil, it ain't in Asia. So they could still be on the way to that 2030 target. And hey, Brazil are a good football team, all right? At least if you're going to lose heavily, lose heavily to a good football team. They lost 5-1 to Thailand. I'm finished. Jose was promptly sacked, even though he'd been told before there was absolutely no pressure and that he'd been given a long, long time to manage this team. And this result against Thailand was a real turning point that you'll hear me talk about again in a little bit. Now, by 2015, and there were signs of promise. An Asian Cup campaign that saw them win every single group stage match only to go out to Australia in the knockout stages at least saw them get out of the group stages for the first time in a decade. But by 2018, they were drawing to Hong Kong again. Serious action needed to be taken. Marcelo Lippi, World Cup winning manager, was hired. Fabio Cannavaro, World Cup winning captain, was hired. Players were getting what is called naturalized, where someone who has Chinese heritage or background, or if they've lived and played and worked in the nation for approximately three years, can be inducted into the Chinese national team. Who were the big hitters getting added, I hear you cry? T.S. Tyus Browning, um, the guy that used to play for Everton and I haven't heard of him in about five years. When as the Chinese national team, you need Tyus Browning to become Chinese, not looking good. It doesn't take a genius to tell you that signing very average players on an undisclosed fee for your national team isn't really going to improve the actual fortunes of the nation footballing wise from the grassroots level upwards. Now Lee Tai, who I mentioned earlier on in the video, was announced as the manager for the side around about this time. And though he lost his first few qualifiers for the World Cup for 2022 against very big sides, in fairness, he did manage to salvage some points later on in qualifying but was still sacked because he didn't make the tournament proper. Which again, I think really really highlight some unrealistic expectations. If you are needing Nico Yanaris and Tyus Browning, again, no massive dig at them, but they are not World Cup quality players, all right? And if you're needing to add them to your team in order to feel like you need to be competitive, you're not ready for a World Cup. You don't have the quality that is required yet. So sacking a manager that actually did okay in terms of point scoring provides no stability at all. But in the background, something was brewing away from the national team. Remember that 5-1 defeat I was talking about to Thailand? Well, that sparked something in the eyes of the president of China. Xi Jinping was watching as China were embarrassed by Thailand and said, hold on, now nah, I'm not doing this, Xi. As a man genuinely actually interested in football himself, he knew that with the financial and industrial power that China as a nation has, as well as the pure size and population of the country, they should be doing much better at football. And only one thing was going to assist in taking China to the summit of the beautiful game and really putting them on the map. The Chinese Super League. 
League. Super League. The GIA A League was the first professional Chinese football league ever. Only arriving in 1994, pretty late in comparison to some of its peers. Now it was pretty solid at first, but as the 90s went on, it was pretty evident the management of these teams and of the league itself was not up to the standard. This league was riddled by gambling, which is officially illegal in the country, match fixing scandals and corruption, which only really came to light in 2010 and saw multiple teams sanctioned and relegated from the CSL. As this was going on, attendance figures were low. The Chinese public weren't interested in football because it was all fixed. So a new image needed to be created. Step forward the Chinese Super League in 2004. And with it, it saw a clampdown in corruption and match fixing. Several senior officials were arrested as well as club owners, which ultimately saw the end of the nation's most popular and also most successful club. As Dali and Shide went into severe financial problems. But outside of that, and the rest of the teams were starting to flourish. President Xi Jinping gave incentives, let's say, to businessmen of China to take over Chinese Super League clubs and pump a ridiculous amount of money into them. Bringing stars of football from across the globe, the South America, Europe, paying them absolutely mental amounts of money to try and grow the status of the beautiful game in China. By 2011, there was already a big increase in popularity as the likes of Didier Drogba, Nicolas Anelka, Freddie Canute, Yakubu and the likes joined. At first, reminiscent of the Indian intake that I talked about in the last video. You can check that out down in the description. A lot of guys passed their best, but also massive, massive names here. Guangzhou Evergrande, a key, key name in the origins of the Chinese Super League, started to dominate. Winning multiple titles, going far in the Asian Champions League, and they continued their spending. And so did the rest of the Chinese Super League, with the likes of Paulinho, Jackson Martinez. What a what happened to him? Alex Teixeira, who the Chinese Super League managed to snatch away from Liverpool after he decided he wanted to leave Shakhtar Donetsk, a really key point in the history of this league. There was £388 million of transfer fees spent by Chinese clubs, and the big names wouldn't stop. Freddy Guarin, Carlos Tevez, Alexander Pato, John Obi Mikel, Axel Witzel, Ezekiel Levetsi, whilst offending the entire nation, and a new poster boy in Oscar. Now, Oscar was the real, real big one. This was a man in his prime. He'd signed for Chelsea in 2012, and during his time, he'd won two Premier Leagues with the Blues, as well as a Europa League title. Chelsea, unlike <clears throat> today, fuck Chelsea, pussy, were one of the biggest and most successful clubs in the world, let alone just in England. With £60 million on the table, Oscar would head over to the East and sign for Shanghai SIPG, even though Barcelona were interested in signing him. He'd be made one of the top four highest earners in the entire world of football, helping Shanghai SIPG win their first title in the Chinese Super League in 2018 and then again in 2023, forming a dynamic duo with Brazilian teammate Hulk. Now let's be honest here, the reason he went in the first place was because of the money. Even though you have 10 million trophy, you can't use that to go and buy food in the supermarket. You know, Shanghai SIPG hadn't been too successful up until this point. It was a real rags to riches story. All you needed was the entire defense budget of the United States of America. But there were loads of these teams that have popped up that were maybe even playing in the second, third division of Chinese football had been bought by massive, massive companies across the country invested some mental money into signing some of the best players in the world at that time and also Graziano Pele and now were a very attractive option to players genuinely in their prime. I mean imagine being a poor young Chinese centre-back seeing Hulk's calves galloping towards you. I don't know what the fuck to do! I don't know what to do! You're about to get more drillings than him then... <clears throat> His knees get. But for me, if there's one thing that this time of spending is remembered for, it's for the irrational and completely inconsistent signings. Imagine being a Chinese Super League fan, seeing Carlos Tevez arrive on your shores. You 36! 42 million pounds for Paulinho is tax fraud. Yeah, 999, this is HMRC. Like, it was crazy. Cash was being thrown about at everybody. Yes, the good players. You know, Yannick Ferreira Carrasco, for example. You know what he's saying when any sort of big money move is made for him. Tell him to bring me my money. Yeah! Yeah! Then on the flip side, anyone paying Solomon Rondon £20 million a year has got a go me. On my life, I genuinely just think the owners of the Chinese Super League playing a load of FIFA 15 Ultimate Team. El Sharawe, El Kusun, Adrian Ramos, Freddy Guarin, Javinho for Christ's sake. These lot were watching Race to Division 1. And all those things would slow down, even with the arrivals of the likes of Marco Arnautovic and Solomon Rondon. Things were only about to get worse for Chinese Super League clubs. Because now, in 2024, spare a thought for Oscar when he looks around for the rest of the marquee signings and only sees Marouane Fellaini. <laughs>
There's a reason why there aren't these Chinese Super League big names anymore. First of all, the COVID-19 outbreak, of course, hit China and their economy really, really hard in 2020. It saw the nation adopt a zero COVID policy that basically had it in lockdown for several years. We've only got the Formula One going back there for the first time in four years, having been cancelled ever since the outbreak. Four years after that original outbreak, we look at some of the clubs that were dominating in the early days of the Chinese Super League and wonder where they are now. A lot of them don't exist at all. Shenzhen, Dalian Pro, Guangzhou City, Hebei, Chongqing Athletic. These are all clubs that have been dissolved in the last two years alone. Lots of which have found success and won Chinese Super League titles. And others have been relegated in the time since, even if they're not gone out of business. And some of that can be attributed to the COVID outbreak. But honestly, the reason why the Chinese Super League didn't continue to dominate spending in the world of football, the reason why the Saudi Pro League seems like it's older, more mentally stable brother is because the Chinese Super League didn't want to continue spending that money. Restrictions started to arrive three years after the original spending spree. There was now a restriction on the amount of foreigners that Chinese Super League clubs could sign and play in a match day squad, as well as now the fact that you had to have two Chinese players on the pitch at all times and two under 23 or under 21 Chinese players in your match day squad. That I imagine was to try and phase young Chinese players back into teams where they've been replaced by some of these big names. And that was actually hindering the growth of the national team. But it left clubs in massive amounts of trouble because now they had to offload all these foreign signings, all these marquee players that they just brought in on ridiculous wages and nobody else could even afford to match them. There was then a 100% tax rate on all foreign signings, meaning that if you wanted to sign a player for 40 million, you now had to spend an extra 40 million on tax on them too, making Paulinho's transfer actually 84 million instead of 42, which makes it even worse. You see, the real reason why the Chinese Super League club started spending so much money, why you saw local businessmen take taking over Chinese Super League clubs and taking over clubs abroad, the likes of Wolves, Inter Milan and AC Milan, was because it was a marketing scheme, in essence. Bringing all these big players to Chinese Super League clubs and watching them play against each other was only done in an aim to try and capture the imagination of the Chinese public. It was also for them to basically uh, compete with their Western rivals. Once there was the realization that this manic spending wasn't actually doing that, President Xi Jinping and those in power decided to basically just sack off the entire project. It didn't really help in the development of young Chinese players because although they could train with some more experienced and bigger names, they simply weren't getting the game time required to actually improve them properly. And ultimately, it probably would have had a better chance at success if it had really gone all the way like the Saudi Pro League has. You know, Saudi Arabia have signed genuinely some of the best players in the world. Imagine being a Chinese Super League fan and seeing Yakubu arrive doesn't really quite get the blood flowing as much. Results remained unchanged for the national team during the entire time and it was just costing them too much money. And I mentioned the Chinese Super League in such great detail because although it was, I don't know, I guess an admirable quest to try and make the national team better, all it did was steal opportunities away from young Chinese players, spend a lot of money, and then result in the complete collapse of a lot of the best teams in the country, which is one of the contributing factors as to why the Chinese national team is in such disarray and probably not that good. But there are obviously deeper reasons. There are grassroots reasons as to why the Chinese national team are aren't better at football. But unlike other underperforming nations, foreign coaching in the country is actually pretty good. The art of actually teaching people stuff is, is good. But at youth level, once again, nepotism is far too high. Players that are actually very good at football are overlooked for the sons of local businessmen. Now in the UK, think back to your school days, all right? Yes, cool, you gotta wake up early, and yes, cool, you gotta learn algebra, and yes, cool, you're never gonna use it at all. But at least you finish school between 3 and 4 p.m., right? If you wanna play football, you can play it at lunchtime, we got PE. And if you want to go and play and train after for your local academy, you've easily got the time to do that between four and seven, for example. School hours in China are completely different, all right? A young aspiring footballer has somehow got to balance like genuine hours of training alongside an eight till 5.30 school schedule and then doing homework after as well. And although Japan has those same school hours as well, they also have an unbelievable college football system that sees fans packing out stadiums and games broadcasted on TV as everybody looks and scopes out the next generation of the national team. There's a footballing culture there. And Chinese youngsters play a wide variety of sports, not many team ones, and a lot of them 
they're very good at. If we look at the Olympics, okay, the history of the Olympics, certainly in the last 20, 30 years, China are almost exclusively always in the top three of the medal table. Absolutely dominating sports like badminton, maybe volleyball, table tennis, okay? They absolutely batter everybody. Pumping money into those sports makes sense because they're already good at them. And youngsters getting involved in those sports makes sense because it's probably a little bit easier to train for. Ultimately, there are many reasons as to why China aren't as good as they should be in the world of football. The Chinese Super League approach didn't work. And I think now at this point, the powers that be in the country have realized if they're ever gonna be good at football, they're gonna do it in their own way instead. That though is gonna wrap up today's video and I hope you have enjoyed it. If you want me to do this for another country that you think should be better at football, then let me know down in the comment section below. I always enjoy making these videos. As I said though, if you're new to the channel, feel free to subscribe. You can also follow me on social media. It is at TheOfficialFNG on Twitter and on Insta. But it's been a pleasure ranting at you guys today. Have a wonderful day. Enjoy yourselves and goodbye.